Hey, what's up, guys? Um, Vinny Melks here. Uh, I just wanted to talk. Why is it so? Why has it been so difficult for the pros or in the opens, or whatever? They're professionals. There's a lot of big names in there to catch fish the last couple of tournaments. And um, I have interesting theories on bass fishing in general that uh, they go a little bit into this. And one of them is, is that we, you know, the textbook is only call it the rule, the, I mean, they say textbook positioning of the fish or whatever. The rules are only the rules until they're broken, right? So I guess know the book, but know when to deviate from is the philosophy that is taught in the Marine Corps and is uh, also, in my opinion, uh, part of fishing because it, those are general, generalities. Like this is what the fish are supposed to be doing. Like, there's a number of pros, especially on, I think it was a Neely Henry one, they were talking about, oh, these conditions were so right for this one, this technique, whatever, to throw a buzz baiter to uh, some kind of top water, and it, it, that just didn't pan out. And then on Cherokee, on the day after, oh, all, all of a sudden that, that place of top water, you know, worked on the second day after, you know, certain places were blown out. I mean, there was some craziness going on, but the weights were generally were low, and it was an exceptionally hard tournament, it, it appeared. Where uh, I remember on like day one on Neely Henry, I think it was only the top 12 that had, you know, there's like 12 um, limits weighed in. Now, to me, when I look at that, there's a couple of factors. So you had that, you had Neely Henry Cherokee, and then you had Del Hollow for the Toyota Series, which that was pretty tough, looked like a pretty tough tournament as well. And you start looking at the commonalities. Yeah, it's fall, you know, it's a uh, late, you know, some place of early fall. I just called a fall fishing um, deal. And then two, what else do you got there? Well, they're kind of more less grassy type places. There's more rock stuff. And three, um, smallmouth bass. Now, one of my theories is, and this only pertains to certain reservoirs or whatnot, is the fact that smallmouth themselves, and we know this, but do we choose to utilize it in our tactics? And it's especially prevalent in the fall, uh, smallmouth move, and in the fall, they group up together. Well, in the summer, they group up together, and a lot of times, uh, you'll find certain sizes of them together, and that's not always, that is a generality. That's not always the case, but in the fall, it seems to be more of a rule, or one of those rules you can kind of live by is that they'll be grouped up together, and one of the other things that seems to be lost upon them is we tend to associate them with just crawfish, which in reality, especially in late summer and fall, um, they will push around sh uh, shad and other um, pelagic type bait fish. So they'll be moving around all over the place in schools. In fact, it baffled me sometimes to the point where I think that these schools are stripers. And I talked about that in the U.S. Open. I'll think that these schools are stripers. In reality, they're actually bass. And... Um, in that case, it always started off with smallmouth, and I think there's a there's a there's a, a explanation for that, where I'd catch smallmouth when the first I'd catch, catch smallmouth in the school, and then all of a sudden I'll catch a largemouth, and what happens is a largemouth generally are shallower fish. That's a you know like I said it's a generality. There's deeper largemouth to you, but in general, largemouth will be pushed up closer. When the smallmouth come in with these bait fish. Um, they're just, you know, devastating the school, splitting up the schools, um, pushing them around, just like almost, not quite like a striper or a white bass, but pretty close. Now what happens is it triggers uh, largemouth in the area, and then they come in, and they tend to school, and they tend to follow a little bit. They're like the, the trailers. So the smallmouth knock these shad around, and they're moving around. They'll be here one minute. That's why you can see them. If you have a, uh, you know, live sight or live scope, you'll see them one minute, and then they're gone, and they're over, and if you just scan, they'll be over here 50 yards. Bam, they're over there 100 yards. Bam, they're over here, in, uh, whatever, on the other side. They move around quick, but then you go over to that same area, and all of a sudden there'll be another school of fish, and there'll be largemouth. Now, because <clears throat> I think they're trailing, they're trailing fish, and they, sometimes you can actually get them grouped up. And this is where these two subspecies coexist of black bass, you know, smallmouth and largemouth. This tends to happen. Now, if there's just a largemouth base like this doesn't necessarily, um, you know, pertain, or if it's, but it does pertain if it's just a strictly smallmouth because uh, they will school as long as you have this type of bait fish, whether it be a herring or a cisco or a um, or shad. So in these lakes, there are shad, and I think that's what was happening. These guys, they'd find fish in practice or whatever, but they move around, 
And what happened is they move around, not necessarily away from the spot that they were, but they move around in such an area. We're so used to associating smallmouth with being on the bank, or I mean, on the bank on the on the bottom, you know, chasing crawfish. Not that they when they're not eating crawfish as well, but they're moving. When they do chase these bait fish, they are moving around. So you'll catch them right here, right in front of you, or one day they'll be right on the spot, and you go there, and you're fishing around, and they're not there. Not necessarily they're not in the area. They're just not in that spot, and they might not get to that spot until later on, wherever they that setup happens with the with those bait fish, where they can actually channel them in those areas. And there's a reason why they're there is because there's usually they get the it's just like um, moving cows or whatever. You're kind of channelizing canalizing them into certain areas that are more advantageous for you to be able to work with them. And it's the same with the fish; they're doing that with the shad, so they can you know eat them. I mean, obviously, but so what happens is you get there, if you don't have a live side of here, if you're not very cognizant of using your electronics, or even if you are, and you're just used to being able to fish these point spots that these fish are, like, are staging on or, or at various you know, points of the year, then you miss out and you start moving around or you start doing other things, when in reality, it's more of a timing issue. You just got to be at the right spot, and then you can either be at the right spot at the right time, or you can be at the right spot and wait it out. And that can be really mentally tough on an angler and a lot of anglers. So in my opinion, that's kind of what happened with the vast majority of people. And then all of a sudden you see a, and you notice, like especially on Cherokee, you see a flurry of catches, and sometimes from the guys in the back of the boat, some in the front, but a flurry of catches, that's one of those fish. And that could be just, if it caught one or two, that could be just the side of the school, or it could be the whole school or whatnot. I've noticed it too. Sometimes the school, uh, in this time of year too, they can be very particular on these uh, sides of bait or just you know, the profile or whatnot, because you're talking about, sorry, i got some suns in my eyes a little bit, but because um, you have a certain class of shad or bait fish, uh, they're yearlings, and that's typically the more prevalent uh, bait fish around. In some places, that bait fish could be an inch and a half, and other places that could be a four-inch bait fish, but it just depends on what, you know, you got to know your lake. So in this case, that, that's how what I kind of attribute it to, the tough fishing, and it can be tough. Uh, because those variables in the equation of catching a fish um, are a little bit different than you see in other times of the year, which most of the tournaments that we do watch typically are in other times of the year where the fish are a little bit, I want to say more, they're more or less predictable, but they stage up on places where they'll sit on areas uh, before they move up or move down or do that. Where in this time of year, you, we've seen the decoupling of the smallmouth, in my opinion, and, it, and there's a trailing factor of aerial um, specific largemouth uh, decoupling off of structure or whatnot. They relate to it in a different way because they're more relating to the bait fish and they're using the structure or cover, but for me it's primarily structure, you know, rock formations to channelize these bait fish in certain areas. And that uh, if, if an angler doesn't really know that or if he's just fishing sometimes it can be very frustrating. You can have these really, really crappy days and I think that's what we've seen in the last few tournaments. And Dale, Dale Hawley say that's a little different. Well, it, they're, uh, from what I've seen, I mean, they, there's two species coexisting. Once again, they're smallmouth, largemouth, and the, I guess there might be some grass in there, but it's still the same principle kind of applies there as well. And you could have an excellent day if a guy figures it out. But anyway, that is my take on why we've seen such um, low weights and low limits in the last few tournaments we've seen on the professional level, that I'll call the Open and Toyota Series professional level because there's professional guys in there that are doing it, and there's a lot of great anglers that are fishing this, and you call it AAA or whatever you want, but I, I'd argue that the Opens are probably the toughest tournaments in uh, bass fishing um, as, as a series. Um, and you can almost say that for the Toyota as, as well. You use the field size, uh, the uh, actual sticks in there, and then you have some guys that aren't really interested in qualifying, they're going out for the win, you know. So you have some interesting dynamics in those tournament series that play um, that you don't in these, uh, like in a BBT or a Elite series. But anyway, I will talk to you later. Have a good one, and hopefully you can get out to the lake because finally getting some good weather.